Dr. Từ Thị Kim Hoa from University of Economics, Hồ Chí Minh City. And we would also like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Buka Strait from the RMIT University. <laughs> Professor Mark Lu from Concordia University of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. <laughs> And Mr. Võ Thế Anh from Concordia University, Montreal, Canada. And last but not least, we would like to introduce to you the chair of the Weber 2023 conference, Dr. Võ Hồng Đức, Hồ Chí Minh City, Auburn University, and the University of Western Australia. And we are also delighted to welcome many delegates from national as well as international university organizations and business in Vietnam, Australia, Canada, the Netherlands, and the Philippines. And now we would like to invite Professor Nguyễn Minh Hà, President of Ho Chi Minh City Open University, to give a welcoming speech. So please give a big hand to Professor Nguyễn Minh Hà. Dear Professor Trần Thọ Đạt, Chairman of State Council for Prof Professorship in Economics. Dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, with great excitement, I welcome you to Vietnam's Conference on Business, Economics and Resources, Weber 2023 at Ho Chi Minh City Open University, Vietnam. It is the seventh Weber Conference organized and funded by our university and I'm confident many more will come in the coming years. For those of you who may not know very well about our university, Ho Chi Minh City Open University is dedicated to promoting a society with active learning by offering the most flexible arrangements to students using the most appropriate and effective education matters. As an, applied, as an applied research university in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City Open University has developed a research agenda that aims to introduce empirical and scientific evidence to stimulate and enhance the quality of public debate on policy matters for business, the economy, biotechnology, and science in Vietnam. On behalf of the university faculty team, I would like to stress the importance of research. Research center and stimulate and institute has been established at our university to improve and enhance the university research outputs and quality. Research funding has been increased in the past five years uh, so, and also the research outputs. The high quality international conference suggests this Weber 2023 conference is a really an important event to the spot the university strategy to be one of the best universities focusing on applied research in Vietnam. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Weber 2023 conference organizing and scientific committees which are instrument instrumental in organizing this important event. My special thanks to the keynote speaker, Professor Trung Thao Dak, Chairman of the State Council for Professorship in Economics, Professor Burkhard Strass from the RMIT University, Professor Mark Lu from the Colonia University of at Morton, Canada, and young scholar Mr. Trung Antheva from the Korea University, Montreal, Canada. I would like to, I also like to thank the presenters for arranging their time and making their way to present their research findings to us. Without them, none of the sessions for the conference could be possible. In particular, I would like to congratulate all 13 finalists with papers accepted for presentation at our Young Researchers Forum. 
you are chairman in in the process of conducting the high quality research in this country soon i am confident you will enjoy your discussions regarding your research in Greece with seniors, academics, and advancing your research journey in the future. Finally, I would like to thank you for your attendance and participation and encourage you to make the most by fully engaging in the networking and learning about TRT this Weber 2023 conference presents. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Nguyen Minh Ha, for your warm welcoming speech. And now we would like to invite Professor Trần Thọ Đạt, the Chairman of State Council for Professorship in Economics and former President of National Economic University to stay for a keynote speech. Good morning, uh, President uh, Nguyen Minh Ha, Professor, Ho Chi Minh City Open University, uh, Dr. Võ Hồng Đức, uh, Conference Chair uh, from Western uh, uh, Australia, uh, Representative from IMIT uh, at um, Concordia University at Edmonton, uh, ladies and gentlemen, lecturers and students. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to join this important and recognized conference. Um, I have been requested to say a few words, uh, to prepare some slides uh, on uh, whatever I think that, it, that will be suitable with the topic uh, of this conference. Uh, but uh, uh, I, uh, I did my study in Australia more than 30 years ago. Uh, although I keep writing in English, but uh, speaking uh, English uh, like in this conference, um, sometimes only. So uh, I uh, find my best strategy today is using slides in English and speaking in Vietnamese. So, is that okay for you? Okay, yeah. um, tôi rất là suy nghĩ, muốn có một uh, uh, vài ý kiến uh, chia sẻ với uh, uh, các bạn đồng nghiệp. Uh, uh, những người uh, đồng nghiệp mà đặc biệt là những người uh, Giả, cán bộ giảng viên, sinh viên, đặc biệt các bạn trẻ uh, nghiên cứu những vấn đề về kinh tế, kinh doanh, về về tài nguyên uh, trong cái buổi hội thảo ngày hôm nay và do thời gian có hạn, do thời gian có hạn, cho nên là uh, tôi xin phép được uh, trình bày hết sức vắn tắt những cái điều mà tôi muốn chia sẻ với các bạn trong cái buổi ngày hôm nay. Uh, có lẽ là thế này, uh, vì thời gian nó không được nhiều, thì tôi không dùng slide nữa. Tôi nói không thôi. Thế còn uh, slide thì uh, sẽ được chia sẻ với uh, các quý vị trong uh, tôi nghĩ là trong cái tài liệu của hội thảo ngày hôm nay. Uh, có lẽ là chúng ta uh, đều đều thấy rất rõ nếu chúng ta tra trên Google cái thuật ngữ về uh, tăng trưởng xanh, về kinh tế xanh, về green uh, growth and a green economy hay là digital economy thì sẽ thấy rằng là đây là những cái cụm từ được xuất hiện nhiều nhất à, đối với Việt Nam chúng ta thì uh, đây nó không phải là một cái sự lựa chọn chính phủ nếu mà chúng ta uh, uh, quan tâm tới những cái nghị quyết những cái quyết tâm những cái phát ngôn của người đứng đầu chính phủ Ờ, trong thời gian gần đây sẽ thấy rằng là đây không phải là sự lựa chọn mà là sự bắt buộc ờ, là con đường chúng ta đi theo xu thế của thời đại 
Và không có sự lựa chọn nào khác Đấy chính là phát triển kinh tế số Và và phát triển kinh tế xanh ờ, Nó thể hiện rất rõ Trong các uh, nghị quyết lớn uh, Trong cái chủ trương lớn uh, Trong các cam kết lớn của Việt Nam uh, Chúng ta cũng đều thấy uh, là gần đây Thì uh, các cái uh, uh, cam kết của chúng ta Cũng như các cái kết nối quốc tế của Việt Nam đều nhấn mạnh tới tăng trưởng số, tới kinh tế số và kinh tế xanh. Ờ, Việt Nam là một trong những nước đầu tiên, một trong những nước đầu tiên đấy, trong các nước Đông Nam Á có được chiến lược quốc gia về chuyển đổi số là quyết định 749 của chính phủ cách đây 3 năm và sau đó cách đây hơn một năm chúng ta có chiến lược quốc gia về phát triển kinh tế số và một điều rất là đáng khích lệ là mặc dù chúng ta đang là một nước thu nhập trung bình thấp nhưng Thủ tướng Chính phủ đã cam kết tại COP26 ở Paris là Việt Nam sẽ trở thành một nước phát thải uh, dòng bằng không vào năm 2050. Bối, trong bối cảnh Việt Nam vẫn còn là một nước uh, thu nhập trung bình thấp và chúng ta đang rất cần tăng trưởng cao để đuổi kịp các nước khác để thực hiện cái mục tiêu là đến năm 2030 chúng ta trở thành một nước thu nhập trung bình cao và hai năm 2045 là một nước thu nhập cao nhưng mà vẫn cam kết vẫn cam kết Việt Nam sẽ tiến tới phát thải dòng vào năm 2050 à, thì có một số những cái vấn đề liên quan tới phát triển kinh tế số của Việt Nam như thế này à, chúng ta đã có chiến lược quốc gia về 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 phát triển kinh tế số đến năm 2025 là tỷ trọng kinh tế số là 20% GDP đến năm 2030 là 30% GDP. Tuy nhiên, tuy nhiên uh, hiện nay chúng ta đang là bao nhiêu phần trăm? Uh, các bạn ở đây ngồi đây chúng ta có bài viết về kinh tế số mà tôi xem cái bài abstract của 12 bài ở đây. Các bạn có thể cho tôi biết hiện nay Việt Nam mình kinh tế số chiếm bao nhiêu phần trăm GDP không? Có có ai đọc đâu đó không ạ? Cứ ta cứ mạnh dạng nói xem nào, qua qua ai biết về con số ấy không? Không có đúng không? Đấy. Đây chính là một thách thức rất lớn đối với các nghiên cứu kinh tế của chúng ta hiện nay. Chúng ta hiện nay không biết kinh tế số của chúng ta đang bao nhiêu phần trăm. Và theo tôi được biết thì Tổng cục Thống kê à, mới gần đây mới đưa ra một thông điệp là đến cuối năm à, Tổng cục Thống kê sẽ chính thức đưa ra con số là kinh tế số, tỷ trọng kinh tế số trong GDP của Việt Nam là bao nhiêu? và của các tỉnh thành sẽ là bao nhiêu à, Tuy nhiên thì à, đã có một số nghiên cứu ban đầu về kinh tế số ở Việt Nam và con đường phát triển kinh tế số của Việt Nam thì thứ nhất là à, cách đây 3 năm thì à, CSIO là tổ chức nghiên cứu khoa học của Úc đã hỗ trợ Việt Nam ra một cái báo cáo về tương lai kinh tế số Việt Nam trong đó vẽ lên con đường đi của kinh tế số Việt Nam qua bốn kịch bản, bốn kịch bản, kịch bản bình thường, kịch bản xuất khẩu số, kịch bản tiêu dùng số và kịch bản chuyển đổi số mạnh mẽ. thì kịch bản cao nhất là kịch bản chuyển đổi số mạnh mẽ. thì từ nay đến năm 2045, mỗi một năm GDP của Việt Nam sẽ được tăng thêm là 1,1%. Thế còn thấp nhất thì quãng là cái kịch bản bình thường đấy là quãng 0,4%. Thế vậy thì hiện nay chúng ta đang là bao nhiêu phần trăm? Thì có lẽ là con số một cái ước chừng mà Bộ trưởng Bộ Thông tin Truyền thông báo cáo với chính phủ thì là hiện nay chúng ta có khoảng 14 phần trăm. Và chúng tôi thì cách đây 2 năm ở Trường Đại học Kinh tế Quốc dân cũng đã tiến hành một cái nghiên cứu được coi như là cũng như là gần đầu tiên về tác động của, của việc chuyển đổi số, của phát triển kinh tế số tới năng suất lao động. Thì... Và chúng tôi tiếp tục nghiên cứu cái đề tài này ở một số tỉnh thành Thì ngày hôm qua nhóm chúng tôi vừa mới công bố con số này ở Hà Nội Tất nhiên đây là một đề tài nghiên cứu khoa học Cái, cái con số này phải được thẩm định bởi Cục Thông kê Hà Nội Cũng như là Sở Thông tin Truyền thông Đấy là Hà Nội hiện nay là 23% So với thành phố Hồ Chí Minh rất đáng tiếc Chúng tôi thử tính chỉ có khoảng 15% Đấy, Và chúng tôi cũng đang tìm hiểu tại sao uh, Thành phố Hồ Chí Minh dường như là cái cấu trúc kinh tế số áp dụng thương mại điện tử rồi áp dụng là uh, fintech vân vân dường như mạnh hơn Hà Nội rất nhiều nhưng mà tại sao tỷ trọng kinh tế số của Thành phố Hồ Chí Minh là thấp hơn một cách đáng kể so với Hà Nội 
Đó là do kinh tế số hiện nay Mặc dù khái niệm thì là tương đối thống nhất Nhưng mà cái cấu trúc của nó thì gồm có ba bộ phận Bộ phận kinh tế số lõi Tức là bộ phận kinh tế do cái ngành công nghệ thông tin truyền thông tạo ra Thì Hà Nội chiếm tỷ trọng rất cao Tiếp đến là kinh tế số nền tảng Tức là kinh tế số dựa trên cái nền tảng chung Ví dụ như người ta hay gọi là kinh tế Internet đấy Và cái bộ phận thứ ba mới là áp dụng kinh tế số đối với các ngành Trong toàn bộ nền kinh tế quốc dân So sánh quốc tế thì cho thấy rằng kinh tế số lõi của Việt Nam Không thua kém nhiều so với nền, so với mức độ chung của kinh tế thế giới Chúng ta chỉ kém một ít thôi Ở mức thế giới thì kinh tế số lõi chiếm khoảng khoảng 7% Việt Nam chúng ta gần 6% Nhưng mà kinh tế số ngành và áp dụng kinh tế số trong cái lĩnh vực là kinh tế số Internet thì Việt Nam chúng ta còn quá thấp so với thế giới. Hiện nay tỷ trọng kinh tế số ở cái bộ phận này chỉ khoảng 2% trong khi thế giới là khoảng 7-8%. Vì vậy cái dư địa phát triển kinh tế số Việt Nam của hiện nay là chúng ta nằm ở kinh tế số Internet và việc áp dụng kinh tế số ở trong lĩnh vực ngành. Do cái cấu trúc kinh tế số Internet ấy, của Việt Nam chiếm tỷ trọng khá lớn cho nên nó bên nảy sinh vấn đề là người ta thường nói kinh tế số là kinh tế xanh trong rất nhiều bài viết gần đây người ta nói là kinh tế số là kinh tế xanh và có người nói là kinh tế số và kinh tế xanh vậy thì cái sự khác nhau giữa chữ và với chữ là đây là thế nào Đấy. thì uh, uh, cái câu trả lời ấy, nó nằm ở các cái bộ phận cấu trúc khác nhau của kinh tế số kinh tế số lõi thì không là kinh tế số xanh mà thậm chí có tác động tiêu cực trong cái bài trình bày tôi tôi cái ô đầu tiên đấy là kinh tế số lõi là kinh tế số sản xuất ra cơ bản là phần cứng và các thiết bị thông tin truyền thông thì gây phương hại khá nhiều cho nền kinh tế thị trường ios electronic ios là một thách thức đối với môi trường của việt nam và theo luật môi trường của việt nam năm 2012 thì đến năm lộ trình của chúng ta đến năm 2025 chúng ta phải thực hiện việc tái chế các thiết bị điện tử và thông tin truyền thông ngay ngày 1 tháng 1 năm 2024 là chúng ta phải thực hiện việc tái chế pin và lốp xe Và đến năm 2027 là các phương tiện giao thông Như vậy là cái thách thức đối với việc ở Cái bộ phận cấu trúc kinh tế số lõi tác động tới kinh tế xanh là rất lớn Thế còn cái bộ phận thứ hai là việc ứng dụng những cái công nghệ thông tin truyền thông Để việc giảm thiểu năng lượng, để việc giảm những cái hao phí trong tiêu dùng Ví dụ như điện thì Chúng ta phải sử dụng những công nghệ thông tin truyền thông để thực hiện cái việc, việc việc giảm thiểu này Cho nên nhìn chung là có tác động tích cực Vì nó phải cân đối vào giữa cái chi phí bỏ ra về công nghệ thông tin với cái lợi ích thu được Cái thứ ba là tác động tới việc mà chúng ta thay thế tiêu dùng vật chất Bằng tiêu dùng số Thì đây là tác dụng khá rõ nét của kinh tế số Ví dụ ở Thư viện bây giờ các bạn không phải đến đọc trực tiếp Chúng ta đọc từ nhà Uh, book hard copy giảm dần Chúng ta đọc bằng ebook Newspaper chúng ta hầu như không đọc nữa Thì cái bộ phận này của kinh tế số Có tác dụng rất lớn Trong việc giảm thiểu Cái ô nhiễm môi trường và tác động tích cực tới kinh tế xanh Và cuối cùng là khi kinh tế số Thẩm thấu vào tất cả các hoạt động đời sống xã hội Thì nó làm cho tiết kiệm uh, Hiệu quả năng lượng sử dụng Thì cái, cái bộ phận ấy khi mọi công dân của chúng ta trở thành công dân số Xã hội chúng ta trở thành xã hội số Chính phủ của chúng ta trở thành chính phủ số Thì lúc ấy mọi nguồn lực trong nền kinh tế Sẽ được xử lý một cách khoa học Và đấy là một cái hiệu quả mang lại nhất Để nói liên tác động của kinh tế số Tới kinh tế sạch Tới kinh tế xanh Còn về những nghiên cứu Về những nghiên cứu tác động của kinh tế số Đối với, đối với kinh tế xanh như thế nào Thì uh, uh, tôi đã tập hợp một số cái uh, CV Các cái hồ sơ nghiên cứu Uh, apply vào uh, cái vị trí uh, chức danh là phó giáo sư của hội đồng chức danh ngành kinh tế thì tôi thấy rằng là các nghiên cứu của chúng ta còn tương đối ít đặc biệt là các tác động của kinh tế số tới tăng trưởng kinh tế và năng suất lao động trong uh, cái abstract của chúng ta có một bài rất hay uh, nghiên cứu về tác động của chuyển đổi số tới năng suất lao động uh, uh, chúng tôi cũng qua nghiên cứu vấn đề này cái đây 3 năm và thấy rằng là uh, Hiện nay, cái tác động của chuyển đổi số tới năng suất lao động ở Việt Nam còn rất khiêm tốn. Các doanh nghiệp còn khá rẻ rặt, e ngại, lúng túng trong việc thực hiện chuyển đổi số. Và do vậy, tác động tới năng suất lao động không rõ ràng. Và mà điều hết sức quan trọng, à, mà tôi nghĩ đây là một cái dư địa 
cho các nhà kinh tế trẻ nghiên cứu đấy chính là các bạn hãy cùng nhau chúng ta hãy cùng nhau để giải quyết xem là liệu nghịch lý năng suất số lâu có xảy ra ở Việt Nam hay không à, người ta thống kê rằng Robert Solo là một nhà kinh tế được giải thưởng Nobel nhờ công trình này và ông ấy nói rằng là chúng ta có thể nhìn thấy máy tính công nghệ thông tin ở khắp mọi nơi trừ số liệu thống kê về năng suất đấy cái câu nói ấy về sau nó được trở thành gọi là nghịch lý tăng trưởng năng suất Solo là trong 30 năm gần đây thì đầu tư vào công nghệ thông tin tăng 30 lần nhưng năng suất lao động chỉ tăng có 4 lần thôi 4 đến 5 lần tại sao lại thế Tại sao lại thế? Và cái điều ấy nó dấy lên một cái mối lo ngại là trong thời gian tới khi các doanh nghiệp người ta đầu tư vào digital transformation liệu người ta có hy vọng tạo ra được một cái năng suất lao động cao hơn và cái gì nằm đằng sau đó liệu liệu cái nghịch lý solo có, có đừng chắc lại trong cái việc mà chúng ta từ cái kỷ nguyên ứng dụng công nghệ thông tin cách đi hai ba chục năm cho đến việc uh, chuyển đổi số của các doanh nghiệp hiện nay thì đấy là cái uh, cái uh, cái hướng nghiên cứu thứ nhất tôi muốn chia sẻ với các bạn cái hướng nghiên cứu thứ hai là các cái mô hình và các phương thức tăng trưởng số tác động tới tăng trưởng kinh tế chúng ta đều biết là mô hình tăng trưởng truyền thống thì gồm có vốn này tư bản này lao động này công nghệ này và phần dư thì được gọi là phần dư số lâu tuy nhiên đấy thì gần đây người ta kinh tế số tức bản chất của nó là áp dụng công nghệ số và dữ liệu số vào đời sống thực mà vậy thì dữ liệu số dữ liệu có vai trò như thế nào trong các cái mô hình tăng trưởng kinh tế truyền thống à, năm 2023 được chính phủ chúng ta gọi là năm dữ liệu mà và bộ thông tin truyền thông có đặt vấn đề với chúng tôi là trường kinh tế quốc dân liệu có thể nghĩ ra một cái cách xử lý đánh giá tác động của dữ liệu và đưa cái yếu tố dữ liệu vào mô hình tăng trưởng truyền thống được hay không Thì chúng tôi nói thật phải trả lời ngay rằng là Nếu mà chúng tôi làm được thì phải được mấy giải thưởng Nobel Vì từ xưa đến nay chưa ai đưa được cái dữ liệu vào một cái yếu tố độc lập Trong cái mô hình tăng trưởng truyền thống của chúng ta Vì khi chúng ta đưa dữ liệu vào Thì nó sẽ phá vỡ những nguyên tắc cơ bản của kinh tế truyền thống Và đấy tôi nghĩ là dữ liệu rất lớn cho chúng ta để nghiên cứu Dữ liệu uh, mặc dù có giá trị rất lớn nhưng mà giá trị thị trường thì lại gần như bằng không. Wikipedia, Gmail, Google Maps, uh, công ty những cái giá trị công ty đó hàng tỷ đô la nhưng mà hầu như chúng ta sử dụng miễn phí. Chat GPT cũng vậy. Uh, công ty N- Nvidia uh, giá cổ phiếu trong gian vừa qua tăng 3 4 lần mà trở thành một cái công ty rất lớn trên thị trường trên thị, thị trường chứng khoán. Tuy nhiên mà cái việc chúng ta sử dụng chat GPT gần như là miễn phí. Đây là cái thách thức thứ nhất. Thách thức thứ hai là cái giá trị cận biên của nó là gần như bằng không. Và tức là những cái những cái những cái nguyên lý ấy, những cái nguyên tắc kinh doanh ấy nó phá vỡ những nguyên tắc cơ bản của kinh tế truyền thống. Hoặc là những nghiên cứu về môi trường tác động của biến đổi khí hậu không phải là tác động cận biên. Nếu mà nhiệt độ trái đất tăng lên một độ thì tác động của nó ví dụ khoảng hàng ngàn tỷ đô la nhưng tăng lên một độ rưỡi một độ rưỡi thì có thể con số ấy nó là gấp đôi nhưng mà nếu trái đất chúng ta tăng lên hai độ thì có thể có thể nhiều thành phố sẽ tiêu tan nhiều đất nước sẽ không còn nữa nhưng tác động của nó không phải cận biên vậy thì khi chúng ta nghiên cứu về kinh tế biến đổi khí hậu nó sẽ làm thay đổi những cái mô hình truyền thống của chúng ta ra sao à, hoặc là những cái tác động của việc chúng ta ứng dụng chuyển đổi số thì nó sẽ làm cho các cái ma sát trên thị trường giảm xuống Chi phí giao dịch gần như trở nên bằng không Thông tin có ở khắp mọi nơi Cho nên là những cái giả thuyết về uh, Asymmetric information đấy, Về moral hazard Về adverse selection trong, trong lý thuyết tài chính của chúng ta Sẽ bị đảo ngược bằng cách cơ bản Vì nó không còn nữa Cái chi phí giao dịch gần như bằng không Thì tôi nghĩ đấy là những dữ địa rất lớn Để cho chúng ta tiếp tục Những cái nghiên cứu và hội thảo của chúng ta sẽ có tôi nghĩ sắp tới sẽ có những cái bài nghiên cứu về vấn đề này Thế còn về xu hướng nghiên cứu về về kinh tế nói chung về kinh tế số nói riêng và cái, cái, cái kinh tế xanh uh, cũng là một cái hướng chủ đạo của chúng ta trong thời gian tới thì chúng tôi thấy rằng là 
khi chúng ta đánh vào cái cụm từ là New Trends in Economic Studies thì lập tức nó sẽ xuất hiện ngay là Digital Economy và Green Economy đấy chứng tỏ đây là mà hai cái hướng nghiên cứu rất chủ đạo vậy thì những cái vấn đề gì trong Digital Economy những cái vấn đề gì trong Green Economy và đặc biệt là những cái tác động của Digital Economy đối với Green Economy là chúng ta phải hình dung ra trước cái sự phát triển này có phải là sự phát triển và hay là sự phát triển là hay là sự phát triển chúng ta cần phải song hành tính toán một cái bài toán tổng thể về lợi ích lợi về lợi ích và cuối cùng là về mặt chính phủ sẽ phải đề ra những biện pháp là integrating digital economy in green economy để để làm sao cho cái phúc lợi của chúng ta không phải chỉ đo lường bằng GDP mà phải bằng những cái tiến bộ xã hội những cái cải thiện về mặt môi trường để thực hiện cái khát vọng của chúng ta là không chỉ có một cuộc sống thịnh vượng đấy chúng ta cần có không khí trong lành có nước sạch và có một cái chỉ số hạnh phúc cao thì đấy mới là cái cái mục tiêu đích thực của tăng trưởng trong thời gian tới thì tôi xin uh, chia sẻ với các bạn một số suy nghĩ như vậy do thời gian có hạn thì uh, tôi nói theo cái, cái suy nghĩ của mình mặc dù có bài chuẩn bị uh, slide thì bạn nào quan tâm hơn thì có thể đọc cái slide này và chúng tôi sẽ có những cái trao đổi sau vì tôi nghĩ đây là những cái vấn đề mà nó mang tính rất là khái quát tôi không đi vào vấn đề gì cụ thể uh, xin uh, Uh, một lần nữa trân trọng cảm ơn giáo sư Nguyễn Minh Hà đã mời tôi uh, được chia sẻ một số cái, cái suy nghĩ về hai cái chủ đề chủ đạo trong tăng trưởng kinh tế của Việt Nam trong phương thức tăng trưởng kinh tế của Việt Nam trong những kỳ kinh tới và xin chúc hội thảo của chúng ta thành công tốt đẹp xin chào cảm ơn Thank you for your speech. And now, on behalf of the Viper 2023 Committee, Dr. Võ Hồng Đức, the chair of the conference, would like to give a speech. So please welcome Dr. Võ Hồng Đức. Professor Nguyễn Minh Hà, the president of Ho Chi Minh City Open University. Professor Trần Thọ Đạt, um, the chairman of the state council on professorship in economics professor nguyễn thuấn the editor in chief uh, journal of science ho chi minh city open university distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen first of all i would like to welcome you to our seven vietnam conference on business economics and resources 2023 this year our conference is very unique and it is very different we really focus on our young scholar. We believe that they will, cut, they will play the important role in conducting high quality research for Vietnam in the future. Just before I start, I would like to thank our keynote speaker, Professor um, Burkhardt Surai from RMIT University, Professor Mark Lu from uh, Concordia, University of Edmonton in um, Canada. Uh, and um, Dr. Tribi Vartian from another Concordia University in Canada, in Montreal. So thank you for making your time here today and our presenter. Um, as we say, today is designed to listen to our distinguished speak from Professor Nguyễn Minh Ha and Prof Professor Trần Thọ Đạt. We are going to welcome our keynote speak from Professor Burkhardt Schreib and Professor Mark Lu. And then we go in doubt into our key point. We listen to 12 presentations from 12 young Vietnamese scholars. And you will be surprised. You can see our up 12 speakers today. One of them is as young as 18 years old. And just by the way, I'd like to introduce, I just see from the audience, Professor Nguyễn Văn Phương from International University. Uh, uh, I believe he, he is sitting behind um, without my attention on that. Um, last but not least, in order to run today's successful, I would like to um, thank you for the panel. Uh, the first one, I'd like to thank you, um, Dr. Tư Tị Kim Thoa from University of Economics Ho Chi Minh City, the panel chair today. Second one, Dr. Vân Thị Hồng Loan, the Dean of School of Advanced Study 
uh, Ho Chi Minh City Open University. Professor Mark Lu will be in the panel member today. Uh, Mr. Trần Phú Ngọc from Sunrise uh, Vietnam. Um, he is completing his PhD at Ho Chi Minh City Open University with the intensive publication in the top tier journals. And um, Dr. Chubi um, Võ Thế An from Concordia University in Montreal. Last but not least, I'd like to say thank you for all my team members who do everything to make today's conference possible. Thank you very much, and I will see you soon. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Võ Hồng Đức, for your speech. Uh, and now, we would like to invite our keynote speaker, Dr. Buka Strait, Professor Mark Lu, and Mr. Võ Thế Anh to come on stage to receive flags and flowers from the organizing committee of the conference. And we would like to invite Professor Nguyễn Minh Hà to give flags and flowers to our keynote speaker for their great contribution. Thank you so much, Professor Nguyễn Minh Hà and our keynote speaker. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Nguyễn Minh Hà and our keynote speaker. Uh, yes, we can go. Yeah. <coughs> and finally, we would like to invite our trail young scholar to come on stage and receive certificates of merit from Ho Chi Minh City Open University and the Viber 2023 Conference Organizing Committee. Uh, first, I would like to invite Wun Jun from University of Economics, Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, Wun Nguyen from International University, Vietnam National University, Ho Chi Minh City. An Nguyen from Foreign Trade University, Ho Chi Minh City. Thảo Trần from Foreign Trade University, Ho Chi Minh City. Han Trần from Western Sydney University, Australia. Won Trần from University of Economics, Ho Chi Minh City. M Minh Trần from Ho Chi Minh City, Open University. An Phạm from University of Economics and Law, Vietnam National University, Ho Chi Minh City. Ngân Lê from Hoa Sen University Hoàng Trần from Macquarie University, Australia Nam Vũ from Ho Chi Minh City, uh, Open University and Toàn Phạm from Macquarie University and we would like to invite Professor Nguyễn Minh Hà and Dr. Võ Hồng Đức uh, to come on stage to give certificates of merit to our young scholar
Uh, thank you so much, Professor Nguyễn Minh Hà, Dr. Võ Hồng Đức, and our young scholar. And we would also like to express our sincere thanks to all of the members of the conference organizing committee. The great contribution plays an important role in the success of the VIPA 2023 conference. And now, here comes the most important part of this morning, the plenary session of our two keynote speakers. And Dr. Võ Hồng Đức will be the chairman for this session. So please welcome Dr. Võ Hồng Đức onto stage. Thank you, Nam, uh, for your um, excellent uh, MC, uh, even though I know it is the first time you do it. And it is follow my philosophy, you can do it if you really want to do it. So that is the message I want to send to all of you. So now, um, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to chair um, the uh, plenary session. So this session will include two important speech. So the first one from Professor Bukhat, um, Shrey from RMIT University, and the second one is Professor uh, Mark Lu from Concordia University in um, Edmonton, Canada. Um, so, first one about um, Professor uh, Burkhardt Shrey from RMIT University. Uh, Burkhardt is the program, a senior program manager at the business school at RMIT University of Vietnam. He oversees the executive MBA program, the MBA program, and the undergraduate management program. Uh, prior to joining RMIT University of Vietnam, Burkhardt was a professor of strategy and orientation in, at Singapore Management University. Uh, he has received too many award winning for his excellent um, teaching um, and uh, contribution to student uh, success. Burkhardt is also the senior fellow at the Wharton School and he has lectured at Harvard Business School in America before he came to Vietnam. So Burkhardt have a lot of or intensive experience working um, in the consultant firm uh, on various topics from transformative corporate transaction. Uh, Burkhardt received his PhD um, and the MILD degree from Fletcher School at Tufts University in cooperation with Harvard University. So here it is, I'd like to welcome you to the stage to deliver the keynote speech. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, welcome everyone, and um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Duke Vo, to invite me to do the keynote here this morning, and thank you, Professor Minha, to invite me as well. Thank you, Open University, for your hospitality. Um, when uh, Professor Vo asked me to do a keynote speech uh, at this uh, Weber conference, I asked him, "So, what is it about?" And he said, it's for young Vietnamese researchers. And then I said, I'm not Vietnamese, but I'm young, right? <laughs> and then he said, no, that's not why you come in, right? Like, so, and then I was thinking, um, yeah, maybe I spent more time in academia and also in the business world than uh, many of you are uh, alive. So, so perhaps I, um, can share some of the sort of insights I have learned over the last 25 years of doing, doing research, but also being engaged in business. 
So this is not just an academic presentation like you have to do. I have a much easier job because there will be no questions asked. But if you, if you want to ask me later, feel free and can come and uh, approach me. So my, my main task is, um, you know, other than putting the slides on the screen, uh, is actually to motivate you. I want to make you feel good in being an academic researcher. Right? I want you to be happy this evening, right? So, but the fact that you actually chose to come on a Saturday morning uh, to an academic conference speaks a lot about you. So, so this is, this is a really, um, you know, a great sign for, for you. Um, so, so I wanted to uh, share with you sort of uh, my, my experiences and I want to do that in three parts. You know, the first part is about, so what can we research about? So what is sort of like the topical areas that we should choose? So, so um, I have about sort of 40 minutes, right? So I don't bore you too much, right? And with uh, my German accent, I'm from Germany. I have been in Vietnam for 12 years. So I, I know a little bit what's going on, uh, but I don't speak very well Vietnamese also, right? So, so, so my, um, so the, um, uh, but I still, I, th I consider myself a little bit giving you an outside perspective rather than an inside perspective, right? So, um, so three things, what can we do? What, what means, what can we research? What, what are the things that might be of interest? Then the second is like, how can we do that? And maybe I want to give you some sort of non-conventional ways of doing research where I suspect there will be more demand for new methods, right? And then why actually are we doing this? Right, sort of like the fundamental question, right? So, so um, <clears throat> let me start by showing you this sort of graph here. Um, I, I, so I, I went out, uh, it's like, okay, so, so um, I said, the next uh, decade is the decade of Vietnam academic researchers, so you're well placed. And now I have to, I have to substantiate that claim, right? I have to say why, right? And actually, if you look at, uh, first of all, sort of the world academic output is rising, right? And COVID or not COVID, economic crisis or not economic crisis, academic research is on the rise. But what is even stronger growing is academic research in Asia, right? So this is what this sort of graph shows us. I think the blue line here, this is the uh, percentage of academic research as part of the whole world output uh, coming from Asia, right? So about uh, uh, 15 years ago, there was about four, sort of four percent, four percent of the world academic research was produced in Asia, and now it's about eight percent. So it has doubled. It has doubled the world output. So it's a strong growth. So within the growing world uh, output of research, Asia is growing faster, much faster, right? Um, so we are in a good place, but this, this is uh, perhaps more interesting. This is the output of Vietnamese academic research. You know, the sort of stuff that I haven't done, but I found it in, in, in a study. So this is the world of science. All, all Vietnamese affiliate sort of researchers that are affiliated with Vietnamese institutions. So they count, they count how many, many sort of publications are indexed in, in Scopus or world of research. And, and as you can see, Vietnam is pretty much, uh, pretty, <laughs> this, is, this is exponential, right? So this is a, almost like a, the definition of exponential growth. <coughs> so um, <coughs> so uh, between 2009, uh, sort of here and on today, um, you know, the, the, the research output of Vietnamese researchers has, uh, um, you know, multiplied by five. <laughs> And imagine this is a stock. A stock. <laughs> you want to buy that stock, and actually, by coming this morning, you have bought this this stock, right? So you should be very happy, uh, because this is something that probably doesn't sort of plummet all of a sudden or so. So, so you you're you're in a good place, right? Uh, so, 
academic research is growing, Asia is growing faster, and within that, Vietnam is growing even faster, right? So you are in a good spot. You should feel be very good. Um, so this is, of course, all academic publications, so uh, any uh, scientific publications. So, so here, this is a, a business, economics, and resources conference, but we can assume there is a constant part of that. So it's probably, actually, if I would make a guess, if I sort of carve out, if I just take out the research in economics, uh, uh, resources, and, and uh, business, probably that curve is even even growing even stronger right so so perhaps almost i could stop here and wish you a, have a good saturday right because my main job was to tell you 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 make the right choices you should be happy to be an academic researcher but i i think maybe we should go on a bit more right otherwise uh, i don't get my water uh, to pay right talking of it So um, actually, sort of, if you if you look a little bit, also sort of like to compa com competitors, like where is Vietnam compared to others? In fact, there's a, there's an interesting study, um, sort of looking at sort of comparative across countries research output, um, and in fact, they they in Asia. So Vietnam is uh, among the major producers. Sort of, they they, they grouped it into three buckets of countries, right? So major producers, minor producers, and sort of zero producers, like Myanmar and, and all those countries. So, um, so Vietnam is already in the, sort of like in the big boys league, right? So it's a major research producer. Um, and sort of within all these countries, so in the last decade, actually this growth rate is actually the, the fastest growth rate in, in Asia. Um, and what we can see is that actually this is the uh, sort of number of um, you know publications per year um, you know indexed in in Scopus and so forth. So if I look at uh, where we are today in, or like three years ago in Vietnam, we are more or less this is this blue line uh, here. This is Singapore. So in Vietnam we are where Singapore was 20 years ago, right? And in Singapore, actually, the growth rate is sort of slowing down, uh, whereas here it's accelerating. So, so we are in a really good spot here. Um, and of course, there is no reason to believe that sort of uh, the growth will stop. In fact, because you are interested uh, in academic research, it's kind of your job to continue this growth curve, right? Um, um, yeah, so uh, why, 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 of course, has this grown in Vietnam and across the region? Typically, people would think about three, three main drivers of that growth. One is, uh, you know, better human capital. So uh, people go longer to school, they have better, better sort of equipment from, from their high school uh, and from the university studies. Um, so the human capital has sort of uh, is more sophisticated for academic research these days. Then a big part is that the institutions like universities, um, there were many reforms in Vietnam, I understand, um, you know, sort of there, there were some uh, institutional changes uh, in the higher education system where research gets sort of valued and so forth. So that's one of the drivers. And then of course, incentive structures, right? So, so a number of universities, they, they they, they reward individuals who publish, right? So, so, they're, so th this is sort of like uh, um, three, three growth drivers of this research, uh, research growth. Um, so, so this is actually sort of just to warm you up, right? This is just to warm you up, to make you feel good. We're in a great space. So what can we do? And of course, I could start by saying, you know, sort of there are some elephants in the room. Elephants in the room are topics that are so obvious that you don't talk about it, right? And I actually generated this with Adobe Firefly, maybe. Um, so, so that's the only, only sort of uh, 
uh, artificial intelligence in this in this presentation, right? It's you know you nowadays people always read ChatGPT's uh, welcome speeches and so forth, but this is the only only uh, generative AI piece here. I actually asked, give me an elephant in a typical li Vietnamese living room, and this is what came out, right? So <coughs> so there are some elephants in the room that I actually won't talk about. Um, for in sort of topics, right? So you're thinking about, so what should I, should I sort of write about? And what should I sort of ask about? Um, so there's, of course, you know, generative AI, right? Sort of like, sort of now we have synthetic sort of intelligence, right? So, so uh, um, um, Sundai Pichai from, Pichai from uh, Google, he says, uh, AI is probably more, uh, transformative than electricity or fire has been. It's absolutely mind-boggling. It's sort of more important and disruptive than electricity and fire. Think about it, right? Um, the idea is that actually we have another kind of intelligence, right? So, because, so we, we sort of have a, so human brains have a big competitor now on this, on this earth. And that's why perhaps uh, you know, it's more important than electricity and fire, right? So, so generative AI, uh, we are at the very sort of, this is, uh, you know, uh, our zero or our one of a very large transformation in society, in business, of course, right? So, so but that's not what I want to talk about. Um, uh, then, of course, uh, other topics that I don't want to talk about is climate change, right? So climate change, um, what are the implications for insurance markets, what are for stock market, for, you know, uh, for architecture to, to um, uh, you know, sort of business uh, behavior and so forth, and the sustainable development goals. At RMIT, actually, we link every course now to one sustainable development goal, like sort of like trying to understand one of those 17 goals that the United Nations have set out. <coughs> to make sure that this planet is a livable place for, for, for a long time, right? So, so um, there, there is certainly a lot of stuff there because it's new, right? Uh, relatively new, but the implication on, on um, business, economic, and, and resources are, are huge, right? Especially in the resource uh, sector. Um, of course, another elephant is, is sort of the role of the firms of companies in society, right? So we are rethinking a little bit what is actually, why do we have companies? <coughs> you know, this old debate, uh, you know, sort of Friedman, uh, you know, the goal of a firm is basically to make money. That's the only goal. It has no responsibility in society versus, you know, what exactly should uh, should uh, the company have in society, what kind of mission it should have and what kind of accountabilities it should have. You know, we have now triple bottom line accounting and all that. So this whole ESG, you know, economic, social and governance type of bucket of questions there that I don't want to talk about. Uh, I think there are very exciting uh, sort of advances in biotech that are underlooked. CRISPR, right? I don't know whether you have heard of CRISPR. Have you, has anybody heard of CRISPR? CRISPR-Cas19. It's basically forced evolution, right? So we can, uh, you know, it's just like you can design your babies. You can say, I want to have a baby that is the best piano player in the world, and you can fill around with, with the, you know, sort of uh, gen genome. And, uh, and just get a baby like that. And there is an interesting case, of course, that uh, a Chinese researcher in Hong Kong already has done that, went to prison because it's not really allowed. Um, and so th that's also fundamentally sort of groundbreaking. Um, but there are other, other uh, sort of uh, advances in biotech that I think will surprise us. Um, so these observations are coming from the fact that I'm also um, the managing director of an investment company. So we, we, are, lo we are looking to invest in sort of next generation uh, sort of companies. And, and so we are scanning as well kind of the kind of new technologies as well, right? So, so biotech, uh, interesting topics. And of course, what, what they mean for business, right? Uh, we are looking at sort of, uh, you know, um, the, the cost of energy production, the marginal cost is actually almost zero now. It is zero if you have a solar panel. If you have a solar panel, sort of like the additional cost that you incur for the next kilowatt is zero, right? 
what does this mean for how we run oper businesses, right? So, so it's because energy sort of like it's the sort of fuels the whole economy. So, so um, um, these are sort of like some meta trends that maybe should should interest us as researchers. Uh, the marginal cost of compute. Computing is going towards zero. Right now it's still very ex expensive. If, if you know chat uh, GPT, if you make one request, it costs about five cents in, in electricity, right? Five cents. So it's actually quite, quite expensive. And that's why, why they don't sort of, um, uh, sort of the compute, sort of the compute load behind a request is very heavy. You know, there's sort of billions of, uh, billions of weights to go through uh, uh, and so forth. So, but at some point we will have a world where perhaps uh, very likely that uh, electricity will cost zero, not in Hanoi <laughs> right now, <laughs> when you have electricity, right? <laughs> um, and, and maybe the compute, the, actually the compute, uh, sort of like the, uh, you know, having basically your own AI in your pocket and that will cost zero. So the, the world will, will be uh, a, a very different place because of uh, meta trends like this. That's not what I want to talk about. Um, so actually, if you think about it, I'm, and I'm a bit biased here, so I'm not an economist, I'm more a management and business sort of researcher. So I apologize for all those of you who do really important stuff in, in sort of resources and in economics. But, but actually, some, um, you know, there's this interesting study somewhere that says all the innovations in business are actually coming from business. And then management tries, after the fact, explain why it is like that. You know, so one example is like in logistics, for example, Toyota, you know, the, the Kanban um, kind of supply chain stuff, right? So where you just order when you actually build the car tomorrow and, and things like that. This innovation comes from Toyota and then thousands of researchers jump on that and say, oh, let's see <laughs> how that works. But the actual innovation doesn't really come in management. It comes oftentimes from uh, the businesses. And that might be the reason why there's like, has management studies lost its way? You know, we are not Im uh, Im imaginative and innovative in management. You know, management research is irrelevant. We are not relevant because the, all the innovation are coming from companies. They're not coming from researchers, right? So, so and in economics, you know, there's a, a famous saying of, I think it was a Brazilian president who said once that the world would be, would be a better place if all the economists would change their desk for a banmi, ban, you know, banmi uh, stand, you know. So we get rid of all the economists, right, and stuff like that. So how can we reclaim uh, impact and uh, relevance, right? So... I uh, have a, a number of PhD students. I have a team of 20 uh, full-time lecturers, about 50 uh, associate lecturers. And then I see a lot of sort of research coming sort of back and forth. And, and I see actually sort of the research being done in three boxes, right? So one box I would call gap spotting. What kind of gap am I talking about? It's kind of theory gap, right? So, so it's like when you do you start your PhD, people always say you have to find a gap in literature, right? So, so then <laughs> ah, we can't really find a gap there, but let's invent there is a gap, right? So, so they find this sort of micro gap and sort of like drill very deep into this gap. And uh, yeah, that's what, what I see, right? Sort of like very theoretical, very sort of focused on that one gap. Um, then I see, you know, that actually many of the studies uh, from especially junior colleagues are very much diving deep into phenomena. Oh, digital transformation. So, they, you know, so, uh, uh, they write, you know, uh, long, long, long stuff about digital transformation, right? But they sort of not connected to a much sort of hard-hitting theory, right? It's very descriptive. It's very descriptive, just describing the thing, and that's it, right? And then I see uh, a third category of so what I call replication studies. Okay, so in the U.S. they have found this, and let's do the same thing in Vietnam, and sort of like see whether we find it as well. 
right? So replication studies. Um, but uh, so so the gap spotting sort of stuff is very sort of super niche, very theoretical. I think not so interesting going forward. I think when you just sort of look at phenomena, that's sort of like a thing that you observe. Um, this is almost like journalists. Like I always say, myself, we're not journalists. We're, we're sort of researchers, right? So. Um, and then the replication studies, you think about, so what? Yeah, it works in Vietnam as well. That's it. We already had a theory for that, right? So, so there's oftentimes no need to replicate findings in a Vietnamese context, right? So um, I think these are almost the hardest uh, to, to publish in good journals. So, but what I think sort of works well is sort of like, uh, you know, this gap spotting we have to do, right? So we have to typically as academic researchers, we have to fill a gap in the literature, right? So it's like, and this is not an empirical gap, it's, it's a theoretical gap, right? So, so we have to find out what actually we, we have, what sort of the theory has not yet addressed Right, but then, so we can do this gap spotting, but we have to use sort of like a good empirical context, right? Sort of like a good, good sort of phenomenon, you know, to kind of show how this, what you identified as a theoretical gap, how that sort of works, uh, in you know. So, so this is basically I call it sort of like your pen, your, your sort of playground, right? Sort of the theory. It's one thing, so you spot a gap somewhere in the theory, but then you have your playground where you actually take the the theory and you apply it sort of there, right? So and sort of here's uh, for example what I'm I'm working on right now. So I I try to sh I share a little bit. So for example. Um, actually, I started with an observation, right? So, you know, so if, uh, you know, female CEOs in Vietnam tend to do really well. You know, we have the anecdote, anecdote, uh, anecdotes of uh, uh, Lin from Vinamilk, uh, 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 Madame Tao, uh, Madame Tao Vietjet, and so forth, right? And uh, <laughs> when you, so a number of uh, interesting sort of anecdotes, but then there is actually this interesting sort of theory in, in, um, in development economics that, you know, people in the countryside, people in the countryside, they, you know, when you have five children, which probably is not anymore the case these days, or six children or eight children, like your parents maybe had, uh, they have to pick a winner because you can't send everyone to Ho Chi Minh City and study there. So you have to pick one out of your eight children, right? And then whom do you actually send to Ho Chi Minh City? You know, it's actually a male. And because of sort of t sort of traditional gender gender attribution, like okay, the female will stay at home, learn cooking, and things like that, right? So, it's um, this is what sort of uh, in development economics they kind of find is like okay, when when you are constrained financially constrained, then you have to and you have to pick a winner, you will send the, the mail. So and there are a number of stories where there is actually some kind of gender handicap. Um, which actually does not predict uh, uh, very good outcomes for, for females. But the c sort of paradox is that in Vietnam, females do much better, right? So, so the idea is that perhaps uh, once you overcome all these challenges, uh, because you're getting discriminated, you were not picked, but you still go to Ho Chi Minh and study, right? Uh, against all odds sort of thing, then you're actually damn good, right? And so this is our sort of theory, and this is the observation. Like, well, let's look at f uh, you know female CEOs, how they actually do. And then this is a really sort of not not nice graph, but but um, we have the data. And uh, just one thing. So if you actually invest in the Vietnamese index, you know, over the last three years or four years, you know, you would have made 9% or something like that. But if you would invest in an index that is composed only of companies run by women in Vietnam, you would have done, I think, four times, four times that outperformance, right? And actually, as it turns out, if you look at Vietnamese companies that are run by females, by women, they have much less debt, you know? So, so it's sort of like much less risk there. And they also have less volatility on the stock market, which is sort of, you know, a signal of operating risk, right? So, so and that also is, 
again, sort of reflecting some of the theories uh, around, um, uh, you know, uh, that women are sort of childbearing and they, they think more about the future rather than the males and so forth. So you can detect interesting pattern like that. So my, my sort of point here is uh, think about, you know, uh, how can you apply a theory in, in a gap? It's not really only about the theory. It's not only about the gap, sort of uh, uh, the context. It's sort of combining these two things. Um, and, and here's why I think Vietnam, and this is my second sort of uh, installment of saying you're in a good spot. You know, if you think about sort of, uh, if you read sort of uh, academ um, AMJ, you know, ac uh, Academic Management Journal, and the, and the typical journals in, the, in my field, you know, you will see that actually all the, the stuff has, has sort of grown up and, and matured in the US and in, in, in then later on in Europe and Australia a bit. And of course, all of these sort of um, countries uh, have certain characteristics, right? They're, they're based on contracts, you know, economic transactions, right? And contracts. They are rich countries. We have stable institutional frameworks. Uh, we have a lot of data there, you know, stock market data. It's actually really hard in Vietnam to get stock market data, something as simple as that. But, but uh, uh, in, in uh, countries uh, where our literature has sort of matured in, data is usually not an issue. Uh, and choices where it, uh, sort of like uh, sort of corporate choices are made under under relatively and sort of like resource abundance, right? So there is enough of everything. Sort of th that's sort of the assumption. But then nowadays, I think that's why why we are in a good spot. Uh, we actually asking some other questions. So so, so this is this is all stuff is solved. Um, you know, so how do transactions work between uh, you know uh, corporations and individuals who don't have a contract, right? So, um, so, um, uh, so or, or corporations, you know, so two firms, you know, having an, uh, uh, an agreement, but it's actually not written down. There's no contract, or you can't enforce the contract, and so forth, right? So uh, we need a better understanding of that. We need a better understanding, sort of, you know, what they call hypergrowth, scaling, and so forth. We need to think about second generation institutional frameworks. You know, we no need to replicate the stuff that, uh, you know, the United States has invented. 200 years ago, right? So, so why don't we rethink the institutions that we operate in? Uh, how can we deal with the fact that we have very, very fuzzy, very bad data, right? So, um, and how can we deal, uh, sort of like make choices in a resource constrained world where, you know, lithium has is limited, right? So now we need a lot of lithium and so forth. So the choices are 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 not as they were in the 1970s or 1980s. So and and of course my point is, um, these kind of questions are the interesting questions. And if you if you are somewhere in in a very developed countries, you probably don't get exposed to these things, right? So in Vietnam. This is what you get. This is exactly, you get sort of like, how do I deal with this bad data that I get, right? And that's actually interesting, because good data, those, that, that was being dealt with in the past. But now we need to understand how we do, do we deal with sort of bad data. So th that's why, uh, so, so, you know, so where's, being in Vietnam may have been a, a competitive disadvantage in the publication market. I think that disadvantage has turned into an advantage because we are observing all the kind of interesting things that academic, uh, acad uh, uh, the academy is asking, right? <laughs> So here's some other interesting things, you know, so, so people always forget this one fact. It's like Vietnam is actually uh, the fastest aging society in the world, right? So I always ask my students, so how many parents, uh, how many ch uh, siblings does your mom have? And the answer is eight. And when I ask them, how many do you have? It's like one. So in one generation, right? And this is a huge shock for the economy and how things work, right? So and actually it gets even more complicated because Vietnam is getting old before it actually becomes rich. 
you know? And that's a problem, because uh, typically those countries that are becoming old, where we have very few sort of low fertility rates, they are fairly rich. It's Japan, it's Germany, right? It's sort of like, okay, there's some reserves there. But how do we deal with that sort of this, this sort of challenge in Vietnam? Uh, because, of course, uh, this has implications on on sort of the kind of public policy making, like how do we incentivize people to, to think about their future uh, when they're elderly, uh, to businesses, do you want to invest in kindergartens or do you want to invest in old people's homes, right? So huge implications of just this demographic shift that we're seeing in Vietnam. Uh, uh, part of this story is, for example, that I, I just read uh, sort of two, two or three weeks ago um, that, you know, this sort of contract that generations have, it's not a written contract, right? But it's like typically where, where children take care of their parents. You know, children would live with their parents. This is what your parents did with their parents, right? But you probably don't live anymore with their parents, right? And sort of like, okay, your parents, they fight in old age for themselves, right? And now actually we have, uh, you see, this is actually the, the blue line here. It's, it's uh, the percentage of old people who live with their children, right? And it's actually only one third now. So that's sort of like, this, like, how do we then, if the children don't take care, who, do, who will take care, right? So there are some huge implications, pension reforms, uh, savings, and on financial markets, and so forth, right? So, um, you know, so this is fairly unique vantage point of being in Vietnam. I, I always, because I'm a strategy scholar, um, uh, I think about sort of non-market uh, competition. You know, uh, sometimes we have these micro -olig oligopolis, right? So I know because I'm a father and milk prices in Vietnam are among the highest in the world. No surprise, from an industrial economics perspe perspective, if you have a market leader who has 50% market share. In, in my country, in Germany, the biggest one has 0.1% market share. So there's much more competition going on, and so we have, uh, you know, so um, we have interesting some market structures sometimes in Vietnam. Um, uh, so again, I sort of, uh, so we have a sort of an issue in Vietnam because the companies are very small, you know, on average. And one of the reasons m might be that we have sort of this relationship-based governance system in Vietnam, right? So uh, it's based on trust. You, you hire your cousin to run your marketing department because you trust that person. You know, in, in the US, for example, you hire the best marketing guy and you make a contract, whether you trust him or not, it doesn't matter, right? So because you have a contract in place. But the problem with, with sort of this thing, the, this sort of relationship-based governance system is that um, we have only 3% of enterprises that e employ more than 100 workers. So we have very small companies in Vietnam. Right? Why is that a problem? Because, the, of course, these companies, um, these companies are not very competitive. They don't have the minimum sort of required scale, right? And so we have a big challenge here. Uh, so we, you know, um, we have small companies, and it's actually quite interesting. Every time, sort of, when we look at the companies from an investment perspective, we we put them either in the box where they made the jump to a to becoming really large, or they will always remain less than 100, right? And the reason is actually quite interesting. If you have read uh, Sapiens, uh, or oh, there's a Dunbar number, uh, maybe you've heard of that, that you know we can't sort of coordinate more than 150 people unless we have good contracts in place, you know? So if you don't have contracts, we sort of fall apart as a group. Uh, you know, after 150 people. So there is a sort of almost a requirement for Vietnam's firms to sort of like shift from a relationship sort of organization to a contract-based organization. And I know this is actually very fundamental and it's very hard. Um, because, we, so there is a, some kind of implicit speed limit uh, in sort of the, the size of the company. So let me just uh, very quickly show you, um, so there's a number of interesting topics here, they are fundamental. 
um, and they're kind of unique to Vietnam. So how can we do this? I wanted to um, I just share with you like uh, three things. This is the kind of stuff I did 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and you were probably doing too. Long regression tables, and of course very sort of like, I don't worry about the table, I just want to show you get blind when you do these things. It's not fun. But that's what we have to do. That's what we have to do, that's what we are trained in. Right? Long regression table, and then is it statistically significant or not? So we have a lot of incentives to do that kind of research. Uh, because because we can reproduce it, right? So so people say like here's the data, and uh, you know so we can reproduce it. People know we haven't cheated, right? And I uh, remember you know sort of uh, so oftentimes when you sort of fight back and forth with your reviewer, they you know you have to uh, change the statistics like the uh, econometric uh, specification like crazy and it get, gets into you know you're actually interested in something very different you're not a statistician right but you have to sort of dive deep into this and it's kind of not fun right so I wanted to and this also leads into some some uh, some problems that we actually have an incentive to kind of play around with our p-value whether it's significant or not you know you have heard of p hacking and data dredging right just uh, I put this here because it's my all-time favorite uh, um, title of an academic paper which is uh, star wars you remember sort of like these three stars means p smaller than 0 0.1 or something it's statistics in star wars the empirics strike back right i think it's a kind of an interesting title but i so it actually incentivizes us to p hacking and all these things but i think think about something else so this is what everybody does right uh, here's like Three, three, uh, three sort of other ways of doing research, and I think they're actually perhaps more adapt to Vietnam than than the classical data-driven empirical research. One is sort of uh, RCTs, randomized controlled trials, uh, then event studies and Monte Carlo simulations. RCTs, I, you know, maybe some of uh, you who do economics have been exposed to them, but the idea is that we, and, and this is of course, we, uh, it's actually the first time when basically the Nobel Prize was given to a, uh, a method, <laughs> you know, because they really, uh, it's not to the people sort of thing, but uh, so you actually look at uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, for example, in this case, um, you look at different villages, you randomly give some villages uh, a special treatment, randomly, and then see whether these villages will end up sort of uh, differently because you treated them. Uh, uh, randomized control trials comes from medicine, in fact, where you give some random people a medicine, some you don't give the medicine, and then you see whether these two populations uh, have different outcomes, right? So, so it comes here, and there's some some really interesting finding. That's why they um, why they got a Nobel Prize for for this. So it's actually sort of taking taking research methods from from met medicine and psychology to economics and business. So I, I'm pretty sure that in the future, business uh, will be very interested in randomized controlled trials. They're very expensive and very lengthy, but but very good, very interesting method. Um, event studies. This is <coughs> this is an example of one paper I did uh, 15 years ago because I worked in Brazil as a banker, and in Brazil, the financial markets went down, and that was actually because some left-wing candidate was uh, rising in the polls. And so nobody ever and tried to, to sort of correlate uh, the, you know, the, the politics of a president and the financial market performance. So I did that and used a, you know, a, a, a sort of um, an event study. You know, I could talk about it after this a bit more in, 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 in detail. An event study where you actually look at sort of what is the typical uh, return. Bef so we have an election here, election day, right? So this is when the election happens. And we kind of estimate, you know, how, how uh, you know, stock prices or bond prices would, would sort of behave normally, right? And then we can see the election happens and, you know, what happens after 
the elections. So the elections had an effect, right? So the elections, uh, assuming they're exogenous and a lot of other things, but um, they have an effect. And actually, as a result of this study, uh, perhaps this is my sort of most impactful study, is that um, the rating agencies, the Dow Jones of this world and S&P, they actually changed how they rate sovereign debt, right? Because they never thought that actually uh, the, the politics of a country would matter for the, for the price of uh, debt, right? So I, I, anyway, so then of course Monte Carlo simulations, uh, a bit more complex, but uh, it's also a great tool to deal with uncertainty, right? So, uh, um, uh, so you can you can look it up, you know. So I don't want to confuse you. So I just want to sort of end in some ways by always when we do research and we sort of looking at at our SPSS and data and spreadsheets and theories and it can get boring, right? So remind yourself why you're doing that. You don't do it because. Uh, of SPSS and data. That's not why you're doing it. Because you want to make the country and the world a better place, ultimately, right? So, so uh, think about sort of your grandparents, of your future children, of the environment we live in. That's why we're actually doing it. So the huge sort of uh, impact of academic research. Um, and let me end by just showing you this wonderful picture. Uh, it's always amazing, right? So you think our world has been mapped. Every square inch of this world we know. And only 15 years ago, we found the largest cave system here in Vietnam, right? So what else is there to discover, right? And so that's your job, to discover uh, the non sort of like almost the obvious. And I think this conference is a great venue to celebrate sort of your future successes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Burkhardt, for your uh, excellent talk. So clearly, for, for those who are sitting there, uh, clearly research does matter. Uh, clearly, at the cell interest level, when you do research, that is the time when you learn some new things, right? But as Burkhardt just shared it with us, when you do research, it's not only for you, it is for the country. It is for the generation where we belong to, and you make a significant and positive impact to the human being, including your life and the life of many people you love. So now I'd like to invite our second uh, keynote speaker, uh, and we are not far. Um, so Professor Mark Lu from um, Edmonton University. So he will share with us um, about um, the business things. Yeah. So clearly, Mark is our African presenter. He, he came to Vietnam uh, seven years ago when we first run um, the conference. Uh, and now he came back. So after seven years, he joined the first conference with us. Uh, it's a long flight for him from Canada, and it is our privilege to welcome him today to deliver our uh, keynote speech. So you see, uh, technology is always the problem. It causes problem the long way. Uh, For sure, Mark, I know that you can deliver your talk without a slide, Mark. <laughs> yes, uh, it's not here yet. So I don't think Mark needs the long introduction, so uh, you can start. All right, thank you very much. Space, thank you. All right, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Doug uh, for inviting me for this, to this program and I would like to thank the president who is not here and I'm very pleased uh, to get to know Professor uh, Dan Tran. All right. 
So, thank you so much, and the editor, all right, and uh, and distinguished guests, and um, Dr. Shraj, many insights that we have learned from him. So, thank you so much. All right, uh, so my topic is on. Ah, oh, thank you. All right, forward. It's, okay. All right. Thank you. The global competitiveness of ASEAN and Central Europe, Eastern Europe implications for business and policy. Um, I like what Professor Shraj said because many times. Um, we are doing sometimes it's like it's an ivory tower you know we write who is actually reading it and what do they gain from it all right so we we try our best to see what are the things that uh, could be useful so for today i'm not into any of the uh, structural equation modeling regression anything but simple averages all right and i hope that uh, we can gain something out of it okay so what I like to do is to begin with to ask myself some questions. Why do I have to study ASEAN and Central and Eastern Europe? Because many investors and companies are looking for emerging markets. And so in order to find why we should study this, we need to justify is there high performance growth in these markets for these investors? Number two, what may be some factors that influence their competitiveness? So usually these are the things like governance and culture, and culture is always related to religion. And so we'll see the similarities and differences between ASEAN and Central and Eastern Europe. All right, which region is more competitive? Uh, to the trade investor, they are likely to ask because there's so much money I have. So which region is more profitable for me in the long run? All right, more stable. All right, identify high performance markets. So I'm going to define ASEAN and CEE. I and will define what measure for global competitiveness. I'm going to ask what may be the business opportunities. So I'm going to identify the differences in competitive uh, differences and hoping that we can find a potential competitive uh, co uh, comparative advantage all right and, and how should each region enhance global competitiveness and typically like uh, economics uh, policy to strengthen it and um, like professor uh, shrash says he's a management person my name is mark mark for marketing my practice has always been marketing, marketing, communication, selling, and in those areas. Okay. Yes. If you've got a question, please feel free to ask. All right. So, just for the sake of research, we always need a main objective. So, which region is more competitive? So, then I need to answer this at the end of it. So, I don't have to go through this. You know, very know well all about ASEAN. All right. That's very good. So, let's move. Oops. Okay. And this is to prove that ASEAN is growing very fast, while the global trade will grow by less than 30%. ASEAN is surging forward uh, by nearly 90% after, especially after uh, the pandemics. All right. Uh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So the second part. So. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I. I fast forward. So am I fast forward? No. No. I want to go back. All right, sorry. Uh, correct, correct. Okay, correct, okay. Yeah, so now, forward. Oh, forward is a bigger button. All right, now, so we can see that uh, BRICS have slowed down, and we can find the Middle East and uh, rather unstable markets. They are not all unstable, they are pockets of growth, but not as a region. North America and Europe are sort of mature markets, and whether they're out of recession is still a question. All right, so, but ASEAN and Central Europe has been able to sustain growth for the last two decades. And because of COVID-19, now the whole supply reliance is like moving away and uh, a lot of it is coming to Vietnam as well. Now the GDP per capita increase uh, in the last 20 years, for example, Central and Eastern Europe is 114%. They're transitioning economies and EU is 27%, the big brothers, the big five. All right. And for ASEAN, we all, uh, you might have read already, you know, there's a gentleman that Lee, it says that ASEAN has always been 5% growth consistently since 1980, and US already predicted in the next 50 years is another 5% growth. So very stable. All right. So ASEAN is one of the best kept secrets in the world. Okay. Now, not a secret now. Okay. Now, so my contribution is that meets a gap in competitive studies because uh, hardly anyone compare between Central Eastern Europe and ASEAN. 
Number two is provide insights because they're always looking for high performance markets, stable and high returns. Helps governments to form policy how to attract investors intra-region as, as well as uh, internationally. Hello? It's not moving. Okay, next. Okay. So what may be some things that so uh, that affect them? So let's see the similarities and differences. It's easier for me to tap the computer. Yeah. Okay, similarities. The first one is you've got to join membership. Whether you are in Europe or you are ASEAN, you've got to apply to be a member. Okay, number two, both were founded to promote peace, to end all wars. And, and right now, the new word is terrorism. Okay, integrate member states, I suppose, uh, pandemics too, all right? Okay, now, integrate member states into a single market and production platform. The difference is EU, if you are a member, you don't need visa, you can work in any place. But in ASEAN, you need a visa to travel to each country. It facilitates movement, but it doesn't automatically make you a citizen of ASEAN. Commitment to human rights, you can see both. And uh, in the case of ASEAN, very specific on rights of women and children, uh, possibly not that because the, the West doesn't have it, it's because of probably in this part of the world, the need to protect women and children. Free trade agreements, you, EU does not have any specific with uh, ASEAN, but EU does with single countries, like for example, EU-Singapore. There's regular political economic dialogues with EU, generally with USA, China, Japan, Russia, whereas ASEAN is ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six. Uh, is my rate of speech okay? Is it too fast? All right, okay, thank you. Now, what are the differences between ASEAN and Central and Eastern Europe? Now, first, you must remember, I forgot to tell you, Central and Eastern Europe is part of EU, all right? So the only thing I can say is about EU. So type of organization, it is supranational, not supranational, <laughs> supranational. And then for ASEAN, it is intergovernmental. The common currency is the euro dollar. 20 out of 27 countries uh, use it. Other countries can be like Norway, uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary. They don't, no, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, I forgot. Uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, yeah. They don't, they, they don't use it. Slovak uses it. All right, central parliament. European Parliament versus uh, ASEAN is inter-parliamentary assembly. Okay, the Secretary, European Commission has the bite, has the teeth. ASEAN Secretary has no teeth, so to speak. It is basically suggestions, policies, collectivism. All right, decision-making process. Okay, Central and Eastern Europe, weighted. That means if you're a smaller country, less significant, you have less votes. But stronger countries, more votes. All right, Con but ASEAN is always collectivism consensus and language policy 23 official languages and english is the uniting language for asean members all right okay now briefly i want to talk about here because uh, asean is a very diverse uh, place look at the governance itself monarchy democratic communist parliamentary let's start a monarchy brunei is absolute monarchy cambodia the prime minister is possibly stronger than the king all right, Malaysia, what is a constitutional elective? Malaysia has nine kings. Every four years, they will elect the next successor. All right, and Thailand, constitutional. But in reality, Thailand is really, uh, you can say it's absolute monarchy. So this is the king of Brunei. So we're briefly, and uh, Indonesia. Okay, uh, that's the king of uh, Cambodia. Uh -huh. I'm, no, no, no. It's uh, can I tap this? Will be easier for me. Okay, so we can see that Indonesia and Philippines is democratic and uh, Vietnam and Laos is more of a communist uh, a regime, all right? And Myanmar is in a state of flux right now because of the military regime and with Singapore is parliamentary. Okay, so 
And I've done a uh, table also to show that, for example, in democratic country, the former religions, uh, a lot of people think that, uh, for example, Islam is the official uh, religion of uh, uh, ASEAN is not true. Islam has the most followers, but Buddhism is the strongest. Buddhism is prevalent in five countries out of ten. All right, and Islam is prevalent in three: Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei. Okay, and then in Buddhism, uh, what we have is, uh, for example, Laos practice Theravada Buddhism, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia no, practice uh, Mahayana Buddhism, and Vietnam is very known for Taoism. All right, and these are the folk religions, and there are also other many religions like uh, Baism, Sikhism in uh, ASEAN. All right, now so the next part is that which region is more competitive? To do that, I need to define ASEAN and CEE. Okay, now very quickly, ASEAN you know, all right, CEE, and when you look at the OECD, the definition is different. But I'm going to take the definition from China because China has gone in with the Belt and Road, and China has gone in Belt and Road with ASEAN as well. So for for uh, China, 16 plus one. So it have included this new uh, these other countries that are left out in the OECD. All right. So I'm going to take 16 nations for Central and Eastern Europe and 10 countries for ASEAN. Okay, and there are two measures of competitiveness. The World Economic Forum, which produces the Global Competitiveness Report, and we have the, uh, what do you call, Institute of Management and Development. Both organizations are based in Switzerland, and they produce that World Competitive Yearbook, known as, uh, or I'll call it, YWC. YCW, sorry. All right. Now, these are the two uh, sources of information. All I would like to tell you is very clearly here, Two-thirds of them is what executive opinion survey. They survey something like 15,000 business leaders, and they use the data from there, and one-third secondary data like UNESCO, IMF, and WHO. If you look at here, you will find that um, IMD uses one-third of executive opinion surveys and two-third secondary data. They study about 60 countries. It studies about 140 countries. All right. Okay, thank you. Now, there are some data issues related to uh, both sets of data. Let me explain what are the uh, problems, all right? Now, first, if the more sources you have, you can cross-validate, you can do triangulation and so on. But what are the key issues with each set of data? Uh, by the way, there have been uh, studies about different sets of data, but ultimately, the, the researchers will come back to WF and IMD, all right? Now, the data the issues, they fluctuate over time, all right? For example, China has been improving uh, performance ranking over the last two decades. That means that this year, 49, next year, 39, or, or so on, improving, okay? So, uh, that's one area to look at. Now, you look at here, for example, in 2014, 148 nations and, not, and 60 nations. And if you look at the 137 and 63 nations, now at this time there are wars. So, for example, many if I mean, how to get data from Syria? How do you get data from Ukraine or Russia, for example, at this time? All right. So, therefore, the number of nations fluctuates. When the number of nations fluctuates, your ranking can be better or worse because it depends on the number of uh, countries that are participating. So, as I said over here, now the next thing is to look at well. Competitors here, but do not have these countries. All right, they leave out five nations from both regions: Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and so on are out, and uh, CLMV and Brunei are out from the WCY. So there's only one source of data now to depend on in order to know about uh, ASEAN and CEE. Okay, now so I'm going to do a time series of 2000 to 2019, 20 years. In 20 years, I'm sure we can see trends, we can see changes, uh, we can see whether countries are stable or sustainable. All right, like for example, uh, most of you would know right now that Singapore is number one in uh, uh, Global Competitors Report and it's like the top three in the uh, WCY reports. Okay, so first, I'm gonna check over 20 years. Next, I'm gonna do 10, compare 10, Next, I'm going to do like corporate annual report, 
five 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 to see is there any improvement all right so at the end of it we'll look into the strengths and weaknesses of uh, each uh, country or the regions <coughs> okay let me lead us to the next question all right okay identify differences all right so so let's see first the results oh this is a massive chunk of data right so as you can see all this data the effort, the rank fluctuates na means it's not available all right so let's see for example like vietnam you can see that it starts with 52 20 years ago on the average 67 over the 20 years all right on the average so you can see the fluctuations up and down there's an 81 over here and then it moves back to 67 so you can have an understanding all right the fluctuations over the years now let's do the last 10 that year 10 years so when i did this paper uh, i mean long uh, I, I wrote a paper on like the best improved nations five top five best improved uh, uh in the last decade i was surprised that there were some people who uh, followed and um, picked up and studied on their own their country perhaps all right now so you can see that this is mixed but overall we can see that over here there's only like improvement over here if we compare 10 years right like one country here another country here but if we look at ASEAN except for here like right you know most of the countries improved okay thank you very much five minutes more okay now <clears throat> you will see that for example now we do like every five years all right you can see these are the highlighted ones they improved mm. so i sort of uh, rank it you can see the areas so one clear example of improvement is indonesia all right from 63 to 58 to 57 to 43 and uh, let's look at Myanmar, uh, vietnam so vietnam is 63 72 71 and improved back to 63 for the last five years this is to show you that uh, the world competitors yearbook really do not have data all right so they don't have data on <coughs> the, these countries as well as uh, Brunei and CLMV mm. and again to prove to you that in the year 2020 there's none Vietnam is not listed so is Brunei CLMV not listed so very oh sorry okay so now I use uh, World Bank data 2017 you can see that uh, that time central eastern europe was not even listed all right not available then it was available so they are emerging economies uh whereas um, you can find information all right so in terms of the average growth asean is stronger so that uh, answers the first question but let's see further over here all right now let's look at the 12 pillars of uh, performances all right so <clears throat> i'll go to the next slide okay you can see the institution means governance then the, these are the enabling there are four things that are enabled infrastructure ict adoption macroeconomic stability <clears throat> for human health uh, capital health and skills all right for markets product labor financial market size for innovation economic system this is like future future all right business dynamism innovation capability so these are countries at the top 50 okay and there is a difference these are the countries in the 51 to 100 and these are the same categories and these are the 101 so they are the furthest behind so this tells you for example areas of strengths and weaknesses and what it also tells you that uh, what each country what can we trade so to speak all right let's take a look at slovakia all right and uh, and, and asean for example two key areas is very strong uh, Slovakia is better than infrastructure and skills so that means like labor skills all right so uh, to what is acceptable skill is like uh, you reach a level I cannot remember like uh, three or four which means that you are basically a high skill diploma like you like UK you finish grade 13 you can read a manual to learn how to operate a machine that's the minimum skills that we must have so again if, if you look at uh, these countries like philippines indonesia thailand these are the countries like ict adoption skills that slovak for example 
can market to them. Okay, so lastly, uh, what else can we see? We will see, for example, in the case of Vietnam, what are the areas that Vietnam needs to improve uh, as, as a case, all right, as a case. Okay, so this is uh, 2019, all right? So these are the positions. So I'll show you quickly the positions. Now, what is the difference between the black and the red? The black are the overall score. So what I'm trying to say is that anything less than the overall score, that means these are the areas to improve. You can see like here, it is a better score than that, right? 41 is better than that. 64 is better than that. So the top five areas that you can think about is number one, skills. That's why the university with the right skills, okay? Um, so it is said that by the time people graduate, the, 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 whatever you learn in the university may not be applicable anymore. So you got, you got to stay flexible. VUCA. There was a Filipino instructor yesterday, professor, that talked about VUCA as well. All right, today VUCA. All right. So 89, business dynamism, okay? Mm. And 83, labor market. And the lastly, product market. All right, and to top it all, I, I'd like to highlight a couple of things. Uh, CE is connected by land. ASEAN, only 3% by land, of Earth's land. The rest is all by sea, all right? And 187 million, 670. Okay, you can see 16 countries versus 10 countries. Okay, so we have done this already. So basically, I'm trying to tell you to repeat is that See, these are the areas for our business and policy. Okay, so here. All right. These are the policy areas of CE. These are the areas for ASEAN. Okay, these are the areas they can do business with. ASEAN can trade or help CE institution and markets. All right. Okay, and these are the areas that uh, CE can help ASEAN. So thank you so much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so we end. Thank you, Ma. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the keynote speak uh, from Professor um, Burkhardt Surai and from Professor Mark Lu. We appreciate that. So now we have half an hour break for morning tea outside and then we really go to the main game, the main focus where you listen to our um, young speaker. Thank you. I will see you back in half an hour. Thank you.